Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the only performance ever of Why Did the Chicken. Would you please welcome to the stage your host, Steve Cross! Uh, chicken fans, uh, first of all, let's work out who we've got here. Can you cheer if you're primarily a fan of humanity? Yeah. <laughs> yes! You're right to be hesitant, because you know what the second option is going to be. Can you cheer if you're primarily a fan of chickens? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, my name's Steve Cross. Hello. Uh, my job for this gig is to uh, statistically prove that chickens are not only better than humans, they are better than every other animal in the entire world. Uh, I don't think there'll be any problems here. Um, so this is, this is fun. We're at the Hen and Chickens, the most on-brand theatre in the world. I think I've upset someone. Are you alright, whoever that was? Are you okay? That's okay, good. Um, so I think uh, this is the most on-brand theatre in the world, which I'm very excited about. Uh, but I'm also aware that it's quite a small theatre, and I think I recognise about 50% of you. <laughs> so by uh, a little bit more cheering, can I have a cheer if you professionally work in any way on the relationship between humans and chickens? Yes, good. That means most of the jokes that I'm about to make at people's expense, those people are here. Uh, it's always, always uplifting as an MC to know that that's going to happen. Um, uh, can you give me a cheer if you've ever been to one of my gigs before? It's the other half. Very high-pitched other half. I thought, which tells you a lot about people who come to my gigs. Right, so uh, I should introduce myself. My name is Steve Cross. I am, as far as I know, the only comedian in residence on a university research project in the country. I know. Thank you. Thank you. But, uh, which makes me either the best comedian in the country or the comedian who has managed to find the biggest suckers in the country. Uh, so my, my job as a comedian in residence, which many of you see, will have seen written up in the Times Higher Education magazine this week. The five people that read it will have seen. <laughs> Don't put that in the video. Uh, that's good. So we've got the various video cameras shooting. This is the main one. So this is the one that when I say something really terrible and possibly libelous, I will look at and go, Don't put that. Uh, don't be rude about Times Higher Ed. Uh, we, we wrote it up in Times Higher Ed because basically I want every other university researcher in the country to look at that and go, why haven't we got a comedian in residence? Do you know any comedians? No, neither do I. Oh well, we'll have to get him out of the article then. And then I can make some money. Um, so what, what uh, being a comedian in residence involves, first of all, I want you to get an idea of the size of the research project that we're dealing with, the chicken project, right? We have researchers from, I think, five different universities doing seven different types of research. Like, they've got seven totally different ways of thinking and talking, and I have to navigate between all of them. I spent a day, basically, having PhD-level supervisions from some of the finest minds in Britain. Like, no holds barred. If they were just going to pile into complex ground while we were there, I was lost. I was trying to sum it up at the end of the day. I was talking to my friends, I was like, oh, how do I describe a project with people doing seven different types of research covering 8,000 years of history? Uh, from five different universities, and they went, oh, it's a cluster fuck. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I did also consider cluster cluck, but I found it works better if you keep the swear word in. Uh, I've been doing, because part of being a community residence is I've been doing chicken-based material all over the country for the past two months, uh, and I've discovered a lot about the British public. Most of all, I've discovered a lot about chicken. So, the thing, the thesis I'm going to put before you is that everything humans need is best done with chickens. Right? So if you look at, as those of you who work in like human sciences will know Laszlo's Hierarchy of Needs, which is a very famous list of what humans need, uh, and I'll summarise it. We need to eat, we need to have food, uh, we need to have friends, we need companionship, we need competition, we need something to strive for, we need sport, we need creativity, we need art, we need religion and gods that we can hold on to and we need to scare the German filmmaker Werner Herzog. Those are the six main things that humans need. And every single one of them is best done with chickens. Let's say eating one. I don't know if you know this, you can eat chicken. Uh, it's radical news to everybody. Chicken is now the single biggest source of animal protein in the UK. Uh, we eat more chickens than everything else put together. Uh, which it would have been quite weird when chickens first came to Britain. Because when chickens first came to Britain, we didn't eat them. Like, we couldn't work out that they were food. Because food is either a plant and doesn't move, or it's a pig or a cow and it barely moves. <laughs> Whereas a chicken, you go, I'm going to eat your chicken, and you walk towards it and it goes, <laughs> And what the fuck do you do with that? 
The answer is, you know, it's behaving like that because God said that that's, we can't eat it. So Caesar came to Britain, 55 BC, and one of the things he wrote was, people in Britain don't eat chickens. For some weird, he also wrote that the most civilised people in Britain were those that live in Kent. <laughs> a lot has changed since 55 BC in a number of ways. Um, but yeah, so the Romans then taught everyone to eat chickens. But now we eat chickens, we, we eat chickens' eggs all the time. Uh, so you can eat chickens. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot more about eating chickens in part two. because uh, be uh, You can make friends with chickens, I don't know, by cheering who has a pet. Oh. <laughs> what kind of pet do you have? Chickens. A pet chickens? Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> They're doing a whole research study into people like you now. What are your <laughs> uh, this is off brand now. What are your chickens called? The names? Yeah. Air Force One. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Those who didn't hear, that's Air Force One. Uh, Sweetie. Sweetie. Bowie after David Bowie. Bowie after David Bowie, that's good. Yeah. Do some of your friends pronounce it Bowie and then you hate yeah. those friends? Good. Okay. <laughs> Menage after Nicki Minaj, that's brilliant, because um, well, one of the things in this country is people who get chickens to be their friends, they all call them 1930s women's names, like Tilly and Dottie and Ava Brown, and things like that. Because um, it's all this like nostalgia thing that they really miss chickens. So chickens can be your friends, chickens are much better pets than other animals. Like, if you think about the common animals people have, you've got uh, a cat, so basically an evil animal that you invite into your house. And then it, it treats you like a dominatrix. It spends all of its time going, Slave, work for my attention. Work for my attention. Work for my... You're not paying me enough attention. Show me how much you love me. Um, they're awkward. Chickens don't do that. Chickens will come over and they'll go, I'm hungry, when they're hungry. And then other than that, they're like, I've got chicken shit to do. Fuck off. And they're just uh, pecking all over the place. They're better. So you would think, oh, they're like dogs. Dogs have got dog things they can get on with. But you know what the dog is? I don't know if any of you have dogs. If you leave them alone for five minutes, they'll contrive to die somehow. <laughs> they'll get their head stuck in or something. <laughs> they're just, uh, they're too inquisitive and not in a clever way. So chickens are much better companions than, than dogs. And also, the things that come out of dogs and cats' bums, you can't eat. <laughs> That's a vital difference from chickens. And another reason why chickens are better friends. Uh, let's move on. Um, Chickens are very important. Uh, so in this country, right, um, men, first of all, give me a cheer if you are the proud owner of a cock. <laughs> That's good, silence. Give me a cheer if you've got one, but you're not really that proud of it because you know where it's been. So I've been launching into that joke around the country, like not in the context of chicken material, just literally going on stage and going, give me a cheer if you're the proud owner of a cock. And people are like, yes, finally stabbed you material. And then, as I descend into ten minutes about the cultures of cockfighting, you can hear British audiences get more and more like, no. no for, by the way, those of you who need clarification, cockfighting is not this. It's also, it's not like bullfighting, it's not one person versus a chicken. <laughs> is that? That's a short, you've got your little red cape which you hold there, it runs towards you. <laughs> Cockfight over. Wow, we get through a lot of these fighting cocks, don't we? <laughs> yes, and a lot of footwear. Um, so yeah, uh, cockfighting is, is uh, if you look back through human history, it's one of the main things we use chicken for. It's in Britain, we're not eating chickens when Caesar gets here, but we are using them for sport, because uh, they're brilliant. And in places where there still is cockfighting, they are the best treated chickens in the whole world. Uh, I'm going to give you some idea of what it's like to be a male chicken depending on the kind of chicken you are, right? So if you're a male chicken and you're bred to be eaten, you're born, you spend about a month growing ridiculously quickly. You're like a giant steroidal teenager, and then you're just killed and eaten. You've lived a month, you're eaten. If you're a male in the egg laying industry, this is your entire life. This is where it, English audiences, man, you can't deal with your dinner. Um, this is a male, a male being born into the egg laying industry. Peck, 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 peck. Are you my mum? <laughs> that's it, that's their entire life. <laughs> what happens is the chicks come down a conveyor belt, someone picks them up, they have to turn them over to sex them. You can't tell from the haircut whether they're male or female. <laughs> female ones, they go, go off and lay eggs for two years, then they tie, they're so tired that you die. Uh, male ones, they go, male one, that's a chipper, by the way. <laughs> Uh, Germany's just made that illegal, so suddenly they've got loads of male chicks they don't know what to do with, whereas we make chick powder. Anyway, so don't be a male chick in the egg laying or the meat eating industry. If you want to be a male chicken, 
be a fucking fighting cock. Because you will be looked after like a Premier League footballer. You're fed the best things, your plumage is always absolutely perfect. Admittedly, you have to fight another chicken to the death every now and then. Um, it's better than the chipper. Much better than the chipper. So, yeah, we can use them for fighting. Uh, art, right. Chickens are art. Do you agree? No, oh, of course. You don't agree because I haven't given you the evidence yet. No, isn't it? Okay. So, the thing about chickens is um, when, we, when we said, oh, we should stop using them for fighting, that's a bit barbaric. And someone went, what about the chipper? No, ignore it. It's fighting that's barbaric. Suddenly we had loads of people who know loads about breeding chickens and they've got no work to do. So they thought, fuck it, we're going to make art. We're going to make chicken art. We're going to breed the most incredible chickens in the world. And this is, again, right, if you're not going to be a fighting chicken and you want a brilliant life, be a fancy chicken. Uh, I'm going to show you a fancy chicken. Uh, this, this is a fancy chicken that belongs to a member of the Chicken Project. It is a, a buff Orpington, right? Some facts you need to know about buff Orpingtons. One, so this is Pete Smith's chicken. Uh, fact one, these are the royal chickens. The, the Queen Mother had a stable of buff Orpingtons and Prince Charles has inherited it. Right, they're amazing, they're royal chickens. What you're looking at them, they're nearly all feathers. If you plucked all of this out, there's like a scrawny little chicken inside with no good meat on it and it lays crap eggs. Right? They're just ornamental chickens and they're absolutely beautiful. If you're looking at them and going, they seem very fluffy, very fluffy. Does that cause problems with their lives? The answer is yes, it does. So uh, the biggest problem it causes is how do they have sex? <laughs> I imagine you were trying to have sex, but both of you have a bean bag stapled to the front of you and a bean bag stapled to the back. And you're just banging the bean bags together. So it's this kind of noise. There's not going to be any baby humans if you do that. So this is an even fluffier chicken. This is called a Pekin chicken. What I love about Pekin chickens is in your head, chickens are like feathers legs, feet. These guys are feathers, more feathers, feathers growing out of their feet. They are so warm. But if you want to, to mate them, what you have to do is basically get a big pair of scissors and take all the feathers off the back, uh, like this. You did all sign up for gaping chicken cloacas, can't you, skip, didn't you? Um, so yeah, you can see here the, the very careful precision implements used to do the work. And you have to change. Anyway, right, that was a fluffy chicken diversion. Let's have a look at some more buffalo pigeons. These are another buffalo pigeons. Uh, very good, aren't they? Beautiful, beautiful. Humans have put so much work into making these beautiful for no reason. <laughs> uh, this one, I don't know if you can see, Henley and District Agricultural Association champion. This is a champion chicken. Look how happy it is. Uh, this one, national championship show, first prize. So I was talking about these buffalo pigeons, and I met all the researchers. And I, I went to talk to Alison, who is uh, also a researcher, and she said, oh, I'm working on buff Orpingtons as well. I said, oh, that's really interesting. She said, would you like to see a picture of my buff Orpington? I went, yeah, I would love to see a picture. I, I've become slightly obsessed with these fluffy golden balls. Can you show me a picture of your buff Orpington? She went, here you go. Okay, so I'm going to give this context. Uh, Alison is working on a system for measuring the bones of chickens so that you can prove that they're chickens. And in order to do this, she has to have a really wide sample size. Because chickens go from kind of this big, a Jersey giant, which is like, they grow up to about 19 pounds. Essentially, they are the velociraptors from Jurassic World, covered in fluff, uh, down to about this big. And they're weird. Like, chickens are really, so when you find a bone, it's very hard to go, this is a chicken bone, unless it's in Holloway Road on Saturday at 2am, in which case it's definitely a chicken bone. Um, so she's measuring bones, and in order to do this, she has to have a whole load of different chickens and have no, that, you know, it's not a bone that's come out of a box from 50 years ago. It has to be, I have the chicken, it's definitely a buff orpington. So she has to boil them all down, which means that, uh, in her own words, my lab smells like chicken soup all the time. And it was very convenient, actually, because I found out that there was actually a noodle research group working next door. <laughs> And together they could do some amazing things. Anyway, we'll come on to that. I've got a science section in the second half. Um, whew, we're flying along. We've done art. Uh, right, well, I'm going to hold at art and then we'll come back to the rest of it. So the main thing tonight is that uh, I've got a load of experts to introduce to you who are going to do, they're going to tell you their funny stories about chickens. So we've got uh, Kate Humble uh, off of the telly, who's like a countryside animal expert. We've got Martin Ostick from uh, University College London, who is an expert. Uh, 
And then uh, Danny, Danny Lobel, who is an amazing comedian who also keeps chickens. So he's got this like insight into their weird lives that none of the rest of us have got. So, uh, and there'll be a break in the middle and all sorts of things. So I'm going to crack on with introducing people. Do you want to meet some people? Yay! Okay, that was good enthusiasm from over here. The group that previously identified themselves as having been to my gigs. And they know the rules. They're like, you better cheer loud or Steve's going to beat you all up. Um, okay, good, right, we'll do a little bit of clapping and cheering practice then. Um, I want you to imagine that you die and uh, you are reincarnated because it turns out Hinduism was right. And you're reincarnated and they're like, we're going to send you back as a male chicken, right? And I want you to, what we're doing here is we're going for the amount of clapping and cheering that is the absolute minimum that can be considered clapping and cheering. This is our baseline level of clapping and cheering. So I want you to imagine that you are reincarnated as a male chicken but it's a male chicken in the egg laying industry. Can I have a, an amount of clapping and cheering that would express how happy you are? That's good, that's pretty. That, that round of applause lasted longer than its life. Um, oh, this is the comedy of darkness that we're all doing to. Okay, now we're going for a medium amount of clapping and cheering. I want you to imagine that you are dead, uh, you are reincarnated, you're reincarnated as a male chicken, and you're a fancy chicken, but unfortunately you're a Polish chicken, which means that your feathers go down over your eyes and you can't see anything. You live for two years and you look great, but you have no idea what you look like. And the only time you can ever see is if you fall off something and the wind blows feathers out of your eyes, and you go, wow, what the, oh. Uh, can I have that amount of clapping and cheering, please? It's better than that. Come on, medium, medium. Good, right. Medium, by the way, some of you are, are marking according to like, an Oxbridge system. Medium is five out of ten, not three out of ten. Uh, and then we're going to go to the very top level, so I want you to imagine that you die and you are reincarnated, but this time you are recreated, uh, reincarnated as a uh, fighting chicken. You are reincarnated as ten kilograms of pure, delicious fighting skill. So can I bat a man and clap your chair, please? <laughs> That is it. That is, that is the level that I want when I introduce my friends. I want you to go nuts for them. So are you ready to meet our first chicken expert of the night? <laughs> Would you please give it up like crazy for Kate Hongwell? <laughs> One more time for Kate Hongwell, chicken fans. I was really taken with the fact that chickens can recognise a hundred human faces and my first thought was, which hundred human faces? Have they got the World Cup 1982 sticker around or something? They're waiting for Ian Rush to go past and they're like, what? <laughs> right, good. Uh, so the, the, uh, this is the old question, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Uh, Kate talked about chickens, our next speaker is going to talk about eggs, thus proving once and for all that the chicken came before the egg, that's that question over. Uh, if anyone wants to write that up as an academic paper, that's fine. Uh, if I could be at least third author, that would be quite nice. Uh, are you ready to meet your second chicken expert of the night? <laughs> you see, the energy level here is good, and the rest of you have forgotten how it works, haven't you? Because you've heard the stories of chickens. So uh, remember, if you don't get it right, right, I'm going to introduce him. Uh, he's going to start coming up. I'll be like, that's not enough clapping and cheering. I'm going to send him to sit down again. I'll introduce him again. There'll be some more clapping and cheering. It won't be enough. Uh, I'll sit him down again. He'll be like, what was the chicken gig like? And you're like, wow, that's this really weird performance art piece. <laughs> My man just shouts Martin Oswick over and over again. And he goes, no! <laughs> so let's do it properly. Are you ready to meet your second chicken expert of the night? <laughs> Could you please welcome up to this very stage, Martin Oswick! <laughs> Hello, Jake fans. Did you all get a good drink? Yeah. Right, let's do a quick little bit of scientific testing. Give me a cheer if you enjoyed the first half. Yeah. Give me a cheer if you enjoyed the break. Yeah. Our contract says if the break's more popular, we have to cancel the second half. So it turns out you just wanted to go to the pub in Highbury. Uh, so welcome, welcome back to uh, Why Did the Chicken? This is the second half. Uh, we have got an amazing headliner. We've flown in all the way from America. Can I get a ooh? ooh? And they have different kinds of chickens there. No, seriously, their breed standards are different. They look at some of the British breed standards and they're like, that is ridiculous. Your bird looks completely wrong. There's one called, like, an old English. Totally different there to here. <laughs> Amazing. Right, I wanted to talk to you about uh, this, the humanities. Right, can you show if you're a fan of the humanities? Yeah. yeah, quite right. You know, let's study us. Let's look at why we do things. Let's look at why we do things and go, why are they? No, there's no reason. I mean, I'll write down that they're doing it. No, it's bonkers. What? Uh, so uh, the, the thing is, this, this event is part of a huge festival about the humanities called Being Human. 
um, which I thought meant I had to turn into a werewolf or a vampire <laughs> or something with goths laughing. Uh, goth slash young adult television <laughs> consumers laughing. Um, and so the, the thing is, why do you have to have a festival about the humanities? Why do you have to spend money on things like this and people like me to, to spread the word of the humanities? And it's very simple. Uh, it's scientists' fault. Because scientists, I don't know if you know this, scientists are very needy. I don't know if you've ever met a scientist, but what they always say is, the public don't know enough about science. I just wish that the public would learn about science. Maybe we should have just science on TV, just eminent men of science explaining science to the public. And uh, scientists also have all the money, um, because what they've said is, give us all the money and we'll cure cancer. And everyone's like, here you go. And, um, have you cured cancer yet? No, but there's a lot of it on telly. <laughs> uh, so we, we've, like, we've had to establish this idea of humanities communication so that we can kind of make some space around science communication. Because a lot of science communication relies on basically saying, it's not science, it's stupid. I've sat through so many things by scientists where they're like, ah ha ha, media studies degree, ah ha ha. I was like, maybe if you had a media studies degree, you would understand why just having a 20 hour long program where a man talks about science does not work. Uh, <laughs> Sorry? It works for Brian. It works well. I'm not going to make any comment on that, man. Um, no, not just even on his name. Sorry? Not even on his name. Not even, no. No, no, staying well away from all of it because he's got a million Twitter fans. Uh, and it only takes a couple of percent of them to be really angry and come after me. And that is me off social media forever. So uh, I'm staying away from anything like that. Um, so the, we've got to have that. So I, I wanted to talk a bit about archaeology and a bit about this idea that scientists look at other subjects and go, God, that's ridiculous. They don't know what they do. So the standard science joke about archaeology is that archaeologists they find one thing and then they extrapolate wildly, and they're like, I have found this single carved object. I don't know what it is, so they must have worshipped it. Uh, <laughs> It's like, you know, going through life now, the, the, the world is flattened, the aliens arrive, there's nothing left, they find one 20-sided dice, and they go, they must have built their entire society around this, around, around fighting dragons in dungeons. Uh, and that's what scientists think archaeologists do, but archaeologists, right, they are tired of this, they are tired of, so when I, when the first time I talked about archaeology in the context of chickens at a science game, I got four words in and someone went, RITUAL! from the back, as like a science heckle against archaeology. Archaeologists aren't like that anymore. So, here's an example. I was talking to some zoo archaeologists who work on the chicken project. They're the only archaeologists I know now, basically. I meet people in the humanities and they're like, oh, actually, I'm studying the history of... I'm like, is there chickens in it? And they say no. I'm like, fuck off then. Uh, cluck off then. Cluck off hen. Cluck egg. Anyway. Um, and so uh, we were talking about archaeology, and there's a site, Flixborough in Lincolnshire. It's an Anglo-Saxon site. Let's give you some facts, right? Because archaeology these days is very scientific. It's about facts. The facts. There are loads of chicken bones. There are Holloway Road at 2 a.m. on a Saturday level of chicken bones. There's just chicken bones everywhere, all the way around it. Um, loads and loads. So we've got loads of chicken bones. The other thing we've got on the site is bits of pottery. Now, in the archaeology industry, these are called sherds of pottery, because years ago, an archaeologist spelt it wrong, and they were too proud to ever change it. They used the word shards. Uh, also, if you want to wind up archaeologists, talk about the giant building by London Bridge and just call it the sherd the whole time. And for a while, they'd be like, yeah, it should be called that. No, wait, you're taking the piss out of me. <laughs> Anyway, so they've got these, these, these sherds of pottery, and a lot of the sherds of pottery are from cooking vessels. And due to some amazing science, I'll give them that they're very good at this one tiny thing, the scientists. <laughs> due to some amazing science, right, if you get a bit of a cooking pot that's uh, 1600 years old, and you do some magic on it, that's the depth at which I need to know science. You do a magic. Uh, and that allows you to examine the proteins, and with the proteins you can tell what was being cooked in the pots. So you can be like, oh yeah, because that's got that amount of carbon-14 in it, that means it was eating shit, that means it's a pig, uh, and so on. So what we've got, right, archaeologists at the site, I was talking to these two guys doing the archaeology at the site, doing this amazing science magic, and I said, uh, so you've got thousands of chicken bones, that for some reason, and this is what I don't get about archaeology, these people who lived there, there were chicken bones everywhere, and their first thought was, we should pile soil on those so future generations can study them. 
Because that's what, how archaeology works in my head. Uh, the proof of this, by the way, I've always made that joke. Archaeology is just people pile soil. They're like, I really like that toilet with bits of pottery in. Put soil on it for future generations. <laughs> and archaeologists go, that's not how that works. And then I went to Aviemore. Um, if you've ever been to Aviemore, have you been to Aviemore? Yeah. yeah, it's basically just keep going. Uh, <laughs> north, keep going, get there eventually. Just when you think there isn't any more stuff, then there's Aviemore. Um, Abbeymore has within it an ancient stone circle. Can I get an ooh? The ancient stone circle is in the middle of a housing estate. If you follow the signs, you actually walk across someone's drive to get there. And when you get there, it says, here is the ancient stone circle. And you look, and it's just a patch of grass. And the sign says, it's so valuable, we've piled soil on it to preserve it for future generations. <laughs> so, you know, you, we can't judge people of the, the olden days by our own standards. Anyway, right. There's bones, there's bones, there's bones, there's bones. There's all of these thousands of bones. Um, and we know the chicken bones because we can do all sorts of clever analyses. You know, they're boiling the chickens in the pots. So we can identify that these are definitely chicken bones. And uh, we've got pots, and the pots have definitely had chicken cooked in them. So I was talking to these archaeologists, and I said, so, there's loads of chicken bones. There's a human settlement. There's pots. Chicken has definitely been cooked in the pots. Are they eating chickens? And because they're modern archaeologists, they said, we can't jump all the way to that conclusion. <laughs> and that's what I really love about modern archaeology, is that they've taken on board enough science. Uh, so they have the, these amazing, some of the chicken people I was working to, uh, if, if, if a bone is found, if a chicken bone is found, like if you or I find a chicken bone, we're like, I really hope that's a chicken bone, not a human finger bone, and I'm not qualified enough to tell the difference. <laughs> I found one recently near my flat, and I was like, because oh, yeah, I lived in a rough bit of time. Anyway, um, they, they, they then have this thing called the bone pipeline. Now, I can't decide whether the bone pipeline is a better porno film or horror film. <laughs> As it would work as a horror film, like imagine the terror, the bone pipeline. But the porno film is like, uh, he was the first gay man to go and work on an oil rig. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. An unlimited supply of lube coming up. No, um, we're not going down the oil pipeline. The point of the bone pipeline today. Right, the bone pipeline. Where was I going? Bone pipeline. Yeah. So if they find one bone, it has to go through all sorts of measurement things to prove that it's a chicken bone. And then it um, gets a little bit ground up and there's all sorts of clever DNA analysis. Because one of the big questions is, are old chickens like new chickens? Have we changed chickens so much? Because they've only been around like 8,000 years. We made them as well. Like, we didn't make them in England. Those of you who are like, oh, the proud British cock. Uh, a, Boris Johnson joke in there somewhere. Um, B, uh, we didn't make them. Uh, they're from uh, Asia. And um, yeah, so uh, are they the same? We don't know. Uh, that's one of the things. If we do this gig again next year, I'll confidently come on and be like, old chickens are exactly the same as new chickens. <laughs> Because we've done the DNA. Um, anyway, uh, that was kind of everything I know about archaeology. It's weird, I don't absorb very much. Oh, here's a fun archaeology fact. If you go to Chester, there's an amphitheatre. And um, one of the fun things you... So, I don't know if you know about eggs. Uh, Martin talked about them a lot, but he didn't talk about the shells at all, which I thought was missing quite a lot. So, <laughs> let's think about what, what is an egg. There's a shell, and that's hard. And then there's some see-through stuff. I wanted to say it was white, but of course it's colourless science fans. Colourless. And it's yellow stuff. And basically, from all of that, you have to build a chick. You don't get any extra stuff. You're not allowed to put things in. It's just there's something. And so what it has to do, chicks have bones. I don't know if you realised, you would know if you'd heard them go in the chipper. Chicks have bones. Oh. I'm never letting it go. Basically, I am looking for the social impact from this gig if you all become vegetarians on the way out. <laughs> Um, so they've got so what they do is they suck the calcium off the shell, it all dissolves and it goes into them. And what that means is if you find a bit of shell, no matter how old the bit of shell is, and you put it under an electron microscope, if it's had calcium stripped off the back of it, that means a chick grew, and if it's still got all the calcium, that means basically someone ate it like Kate, straight out of a chicken's bomb. <laughs> and uh, so yeah, if you go to Chester Amphitheatre, it turns out what people used to do when they were watching the sports was not eat popcorn and drink Budweiser, they would just sit and eat eggs. Because <laughs> there's eggshells all the way around the outside where the people were, not in the middle where the fighting was. And uh, lots of these eggshells have had the calcium stripped out of them, which means people weren't just eating eggs, they were eating nearly chicks. Aww. Can't judge people by the olden days. <laughs> also, you lot are responsible for the chipper. <laughs> so you've not got a leg to stand on with any of this. Oh, I've gone into the comedy of darkness against you. <laughs> 
I know, it's awkward, isn't it? <laughs> right, um, so I've got one act to introduce in the second half, and I don't think he was quite expecting me to end on quite a, such a large amount of gross, dead chickens. Um, <laughs> but the thing is, right, if you look at all the chickens in the world, like the average chicken, because there's so many in the meat industry, the average chicken is a chicken that's going to get eaten, and they're different to all the others. It's like, if you have to write, what does a normal chicken look like? It is in a box. Uh, it's unavoidable. Um, anyway, sorry. God, I, I was like, I'll dig this out of the dark chicken. <laughs> no, I got it. I just want to hear about the darkest chicken in the world. There's a chicken, I think it's called the Ayam Samani. And uh, it is a chicken that has been bred so that all of it is black. Right? Not just all its feathers are black, its beak is black, its eyes are black, a normal chicken eye is black. That's not a chicken. Uh, its blood is black, its organs are black. If you, can, if you see photos of them, right? They can, even a photo of one can actually see your soul. That is how dark these chickens are. That is the sort of dark chicken area I should have gone for. Just more comedy chicken breeding stuff, Steve. Right. So I'm going to introduce our final act. Uh, he's an amazing comedian. Uh, he is also an amazing chicken owner. Uh, so it's like the two giant circles of the Venn diagram. Is, if he had a PhD in archaeology, the rest of us could go home. Because this would just be done. This would be absolutely perfect. Uh, and I need you to show him a lot of love because he's gone a long way. So. Chicken fans, are you ready to meet your headliner? <laughs> Fantastic, great energy from here. Here again, you're like my problem area, aren't you? As the hardcore vegans are like, we've heard the chicken story enough times. Let's try one more time. Are you ready to meet your headliner? <laughs> Would you please welcome us to the stage, Danny Lovell? Absolutely. Give it up one more time for Danny Lovell, here, chicken fans. Danny's asked me to remind you that like every good comedian, he has CDs for sale. Uh, those of you in your early 20s. Uh, what a CD is, I want you to imagine a load of MP3s that have been frozen onto a tiny silver disc. And uh, therefore much more valuable than normal MP3s. Uh, so you should get in and get some of those. So uh, that, that's the end of the, the chicken extravaganza that you've had tonight. There's, there's two more jobs that we have to do. Uh, I'll do them in reverse order. The, the second job is that the Head and Chickens Theatre have just recently advised me that um, they had a dangerous excess of booze. <laughs> right, it got so much booze that there's actually a problem where it might collapse into a critical mass and destroy the entire world. Uh, so what they've asked is that we go downstairs and we buy some of it and take it out of the pub safely in our tummies. Because the human tummy can protect from a critical mass of booze destroying the entire world. The thing we need to do before that is that uh, we've seen some amazing chickeny people tonight. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to clap and cheer like crazy to show them one more time that we appreciate either the intellectual or the geographical or both distances that they've had to cross to take on this very weird night. <laughs> All about how humans and chickens should get on really well together and have really close relationships. Oh, but we're gonna fucking eat them all. <laughs> Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, please go wild. You've seen Kate Humble. She's still right to us with the right hand. You saw Danny Lovell. I've been Steve Cross. This has been Live in the Chicken. The Bean Human Festival is hereby declared over. Which means that Michael Eads has no work to do for six months. So do be nice to you, ladies and gentlemen. I've been Steve Cross. Good night.